morning. In her book on Canadian literature in 1972 entitled Survival, Margaret Atwood referred to our Canadian literature as a map. We all know uh, the meaning of a map for directions. History is memory. Without memory, we do not know whence we came, and we would have very little idea where we want to go. So today I'd like to address just two points. Uh, one idea is commemoration, and the second is confederation. Oh, to be young. I remember 1967 very well. Uh, that great, wonderful centennial year. It was the first time that I had visited Montreal and many thousands of other Canadians for the first time had visited Montreal. But there were other celebrations and commemorations. In Bozeman, Manitoba, the townspeople had a great bonfire of outhouses on the 1st of January, 1967 celebrating the centennial year and uh, the uh, initiation of a sewer system in the village. <laughs> and where I come from in Chatham, Ontario, uh, one of the things that uh, Chathamites did was they reenacted the Battle of the Thames, a battle that occurred in uh, 1813 and which was a, a route for the British and their great Shawnee ally, Tecumseh. He died in that battle. And his buddy, British buddy, Henry Proctor, hightailed it to safety uh, in Toronto and beyond. Uh, it struck me, je me suis touché le front de l'index. I put Quel my finger idée. on my forehead and I thought, what a crazy re idea to reenact a battle le perte, le that was a loss, the, the most humiliating loss of the and war of 1813. are now going to reenact that battle again in October of uh, this year in order to celebrate the 200th anniversary of that battle. Commemoration is a difficult thing. Remembering is a difficult thing. And uh, it leads us along uh, unusual paths. Uh, the most recent controversy, you may recall, uh, was in 2009 when in Quebec uh, there was a project to reenact the Battle of the Plains of Abraham in honor of the uh, 250th anniversary of the, the victory of the British and the defeat of the French. Lots of Quebecers were very upset uh, that reenactment didn't happen. And what Quebecers did uh, during the day and the night is they read uh, from the text of things that had been written, poetry that had been composed, uh, manifestos that had been declared through the night and through the day. They called it the moulin à parole the word mill. So these commemorations are not, uh, are not very easy. And so it's important that uh, we Canadians get it right when we think about confederation. Vous savez qu'il y avait beaucoup, beaucoup d'histoire avant le 1er juillet 1867. Savez-vous que le mot Canada est apparu sur les cartes européennes au début des années 1540, juste quelques années après le deuxième voyage de Jacques Cartier. Canada, Canada, le vallée du Saint Laurent, became the Saint Lawrence Valley, the territory north of the river and south of the river, and people who lived there were called Canadians. So Canada's been around for a I long time. <laughs> I'm thinking of a recent controversy in 2005. A woman filmmaker by the name of Penny Wheelwright, Wheelwright wanted to make a film about her 
forebear, her ancestor, Esther Wheelwright. And Esther Wheelwright was an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary career. She was born in Wells, Massachusetts, now Maine, in 1696. Uh, when she was seven years old, the village where she lived was attacked by Abnaki and their French allies, and she was taken into the Abenaki community and culture, learned the language, learned the spirituality. A few years later, a traveling missionary was uh, noticed this young European girl and negotiated with the chief uh, to take her to Quebec. And they agreed that she would go back to Quebec. She was taken under the wing of the governor of the time, Vaudray, and Vaudray wanted to return her uh, to her family in Massachusetts. But in the meantime, she had been educated by the Ursulines, and uh, she converted to Roman Catholicism, and she wanted to, to enter into the Ursuline community, which she did. She was the superior of the Ursulines, that religious community in Quebec, at the time of the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. And the Marquis de Montcalm a été enterré dans la chapelle du couvent des Ursulines. When Penny Wilwright wanted to make that film, she went to the Canadian Television Fund uh, to ask for some financial support. And the Canadian Television Fund told her it did not qualify uh, for this was a story that was about history before there was a Canada. Canada, in fact, existed long before the 1st of July. When I was young, uh, one of the things that we could do when we were students is Air Canada was very generous. You could travel uh, uh, on, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, standby uh, for half price. And so at the end of the summer when I'd finished working before going back to school, I'd just select a place. And one time I selected St. John, New Brunswick, and never been there. I remember going downtown or overtown or uptown, whatever they call it in St. John, New Brunswick, and walking through King's Square. King's Square is the Loyalist burial ground. Are the Loyalists part of Canadian history? Les Acadiens appartiennent-ils à l'histoire du Canada? Dans la rue de l'hôpital à Paris, on, uh, devant l'hôpital, in front of the hospital, Pitié Salpêtrière in Paris, there's a commemorative plaque that says that uh, the daughters of the king were there. They're sometimes referred as the mothers of Canada. They left 350 years uh, ago to, uh, prior to marry women, uh, men in Canada. Don't they belong to the history of Canada? So, what about Confederation? Confederation, you know, uh, if you read the stories about Confederation, it's uh, railways. You know, in 1850, there were 120 kilometers of railway. In 1860, uh, there were 3,200 kilometers of railway. It was the first communications revolution, transportation revolution. And by that time, uh, uh, the, the railways uh, were overbuilt, over competitive, and on the verge of bankruptcy. So what do Canadians decide? Well, they say we'll build longer railways. The only people that were at the conference, the Quebec conference in 1864, were the Fathers of Confederation and the railway men. Indeed, Sir George Etienne Cartier uh, was the father of Confederation, the Quebec political, and the solicitor of the Grand Trunk Railway. There are other reasons, the fear of the United States. The US had a, had a bone to pick with uh, Great Britain. Uh, Warships had been built in British shipyards uh, that were eventually reached the Confederacy. Senator Charles Sumner argued that those ships uh, lengthened the Civil War in the United States of America by two years. And he thought some compensation, appropriate compensation from the British a violation of neutrality during their Civil War would be to have Canada. So there's a bit of fear of the United States there was a question of territorial aggrandizement. Louis Riel 
knew about that. Uh, there was a question of British imperial indifference or British imperial benevolence. But the real reason why Confederation was achieved was because in the period prior to Confederation, the political system had broken down. And if you recall the beginning of the Union of the Canadas in 1841, that was a political project to assimilate French Canada. 20 years later, the French Canadians were in. And one of the reasons they were in was there were people on the other side of the language divide, Robert Baldwin, John A. Macdonald, John Brown, George Brown, sorry, who realized that the country could not operate on this basis of antagonism. I want to go back to Chatham and to a personal experience. My parents were members of St. Joseph's Church in Chatham. We went to Mass at St. Joseph's Church. And in the 1960s, there was this incredible young woman with red hair, very tall, came into our community, and she was from Belfast. And she was Roman Catholic, and her name was Una Doyle. And she came and, of course, uh, came to the parish and met people, and everybody wanted to invite her to tea. And I was fairly young, and I remember the conversation she had one Sunday afternoon with my parents as we sort of drank tea. And uh, she said to my father, she said, Ray, in Chatham, Catholics and Protestants play cards together. Catholics and Protestants do business together. They patronize each other. Couldn't believe it. And my father, in a sort of Calvin Collegian sort of way, responded, yes, Una, that's what they do. I remember looking into Una Doyle's eyes and saw pure joy. Canada had liberated her from the disorder and the violence and the division that she experienced in the early times of the Troubles in Ireland. Which leads me to Confederation. The great orator of Confederation, Darcy McGee, the only father of Confederation who paid with his life for being, seeing the dream of confederation, dazzled by the idea of confederation, seeing the, the dream of a, a union of so many differences in those days of Catholic, of Protestant, of English, of French, of region against region. And Darcy McGee said a lot of really beautiful things about confederation and about he paid for his life for seeing the dream of confederation and the possibility of confederation. And he abandoned his early uh, commitment to violence and to division as a young Irish nationalist. And my favorite quote from Darcy McGee is the following. The euphonious word Canada has three vowels, not an unpleasant incident for tongue or pen. It is as old and quite as historical as the name America. Like the ice shove in the St. Lawrence before the magic breath of spring, so will cold sectional antagonism dissolve and disappear in the genial current of our great new state generously administered. As Jan pointed out, not everybody is in that dream. Not everybody was in that dream. And it, in some ways, it's unfulfilled. But the achievement of the past of Confederation is the challenge of the future. It is what we are, uh, what we are about as Canadians. Thank you very much.